Welcome back. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us. Michael Jackson was a tremendous superstar whose talents drew fans all over the world for decades. But in the spring of 2009, Jackson was still recovering professionally and personally from his 2005 child molestation trial. The King of Pop was also gearing up for his final concert, aptly called This Is It. But then, on June 25, 2009, Jackson died suddenly in his home. The news shocked the world. Take a listen to the 911 call. Yes, sir. I need an ambulance as soon as possible, sir. We have a gentleman here that needs help, and he's not breathing. He's unconscious. He's not breathing. Not no, breathing. he's unconscious, sir. Okay. I'm going to do a CPR right now, okay? We have a personal doctor here with him, sir. Oh, you have a doctor there? witness what happened? No, it's just the doctor, sir. The doctor's been the only one here. The doctor the caller is talking about is Dr. Conrad Murray. Murray had been hired to be Jackson's personal physician to accompany him to London for the concerts, but instead, prosecutors say Murray killed his famous patient. Four times. You about Friday, June 19th. Did you make observations of Michael that caused you concern? Yes. That my friend wasn't right, that he wasn't well, there was something going on that was deeply troubling me. He was chilled. He appeared lost. I did feel, though, that he was not well at all. There'll be a fan right there at the, uh, off the stage for you. Boom, right there. Did you think he was well enough to rehearse? No. Did he rehearse? He did not. Did you express those concerns uh, to anybody following this June 19th um, encounter? I did. And were you confronted by someone? Yes. By whom? Dr. Murray. He was upset that I didn't allow Michael to rehearse the night before and that I sent him home. He said I, I should stop trying to be an amateur doctor and psychologist and be the director and allow Michael's health to him. California versus Conrad Murray takes center stage this Sunday on Judgment with Ashley Banfield. Let's bring in the host of Judgment and Court TV special contributor, Ashley Banfield. This was uh, some trial, and, and, and you talk about how big of a star Michael Jackson was, and this was about the end of his life, and it was incredibly tragic. It's that, it's that thing, and I know this happened to you, you turned around, you were probably in your kitchen or somewhere, and you saw the headline on the cable news, and you thought, that's not possible. But you stopped, and you were frozen, because it just seemed like that was never a headline you were going to see, regardless of the fact that Michael Jackson was 50, which is very young to die, but it, it can happen. It didn't seem real, uh, but it was very real. And it was uh, very sketchy. We didn't think so at first. In fact, the ER people didn't think so at first. They, they thought it was a heart attack because the doctor who was looking after him didn't say anything about what was that thing? Oh, yeah, propofol. Remember that, Vinny? Remember the propofol? We all started to, to learn what it was. Do, do you remember what you thought when you heard about uh, propofol, Vinny? I, I was like, wait. He's not having surgery. He's not having a procedure. He's just trying to go to sleep. I mean, to me, right. it was absolutely shocking that this was like a nightly routine and that a doctor yeah. would actually do that for him. It was like, that's like the nuclear medication. It's the kind of thing you don't use unless you're in a hospital where if you flatline, everything is there to save your life. And by the way, there's probably something that will beep and indicate that your life needs saving. Not in the comfort of your own home with your personal doctor who's making a phone call, but I digress. I wanna take you back for a minute, if I can, to sort of how this all started. 2005, Michael Jackson is embedded in that trial that he was acquitted of, but you know, the sexual molestation charges really took it out of him. He was worn down, uh, his, his mm, I think his joie de vivre had gone, um, he was broke, and you know, he was hurting physically, a lot of pain, a lot of back pain, and he was having a lot of trouble sleeping. And so he sought out a personal physician, a personal physician to go on tour with him to help him get the sleep he so desperately needed. I want you to take a look at this quick excerpt from the Judgment uh, series that's going to air this Sunday night. Michael Jackson was 
staging this big comeback. You know, it had been a long time since he'd had number one hit. But the thinking was, if anybody could do it, Michael Jackson could. These will be my final show performances in London. This will be it. This is it. And when I say this is it, it really means this is it. The trial in Santa Maria, in which he was charged with child molestation, was a kangaroo court. I think Michael had been worn down by the trial. I think it destroyed his self-confidence. He was trying to regain some of his celebrity. When Michael Jackson was doing the moonwalk, he was in his 20s. Now he's 50, and he's trying to do the same things on stage. There was a lot going on with him, and he couldn't sleep, and he was in pain, and he needed help. He wanted to have a doctor traveling with him, and he chose Conrad Murray. Our Las Vegas bureau did a lot of research on Conrad Murray, and we learned that he had a kind of sketchy past. He somehow wheedled his way into Michael's good graces. If you'd asked anybody on the day that Michael Jackson died, who's going to be charged with this, you might say, oh, some drug dealer somewhere. But you would never think a doctor. You would never think a doctor, right, Vinny? That, that news just made this story so much more difficult to digest. Remember, the death of Michael Jackson was just so overwhelming in its, in its own headline. But then to think that he was under the care of a doctor and it happened under the care of a doctor, what were your, your initial thoughts about that? I, you know, I never thought he looked very healthy, right? Because he was, you know, mm -hmm. very thin. I don't know how much he ate. You know, if I was his mom, I'd say, you need to eat something, right? So from that perspective, I, I understood it. I knew he was eccentric. But it, to me, having a doctor there and you have one client, one job to do, how on earth could this happen? You had to have done something wrong because there's no way that if a doctor has, you know, just one thing to do, one thing, there's no one else in the waiting room, there's, there's no one else that, that is paying your bills, it's just Michael Jackson. And to me, it, 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 it rang that he had to have done something wrong. The question was, was it malpractice or was it a crime? Mm -hmm. So, right. Uh, I love that because the, the expression nowadays you hear all the time, you had one job. Well, you're right on this one. Uh, colossal mess up. So let's talk about that for a second because if you'll remember, uh, Vinny and I already mentioned Propofol. Propofol is brutally serious. It's a drug you should never have in your home. You shouldn't even be able to get it. But Conrad Murray did. And he administered it. And when everything went sideways... What did Conrad Murray do? Well, there were witnesses. There was personal assistant and there were security, personal security agents that, that Michael Jackson employed, uh, Bill Whitfield being one of them, a friend of mine. Um, and they said that they saw him giving chest compressions, trying to save Michael's life, but at the same time, uttering really dangerous words. And that was, clean this place up, put those things in the bag, clean up the evidence, take a look at this. When Conrad Murray discovered that Michael Jackson had suffered a ventilatory and cardiac arrest. What he did was attempt to hide the evidence of giving propofol to Michael Jackson. Would it be strange for Dr. Murray to call you in the event of emergency at the house? First, as yeah, a first, first person he called? First. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Jackson's dying, he would. I proceeded to go into the house and then I told Michael Amir, I'm inside the house. And then he proceeded to tell me, okay, now run up the stairs. Once I was uh, reaching the top of the, the stairs and I came to the landing, Dr. Conrad Murray was coming from a hallway towards the bedroom. He said, uh, Alberto, come, come quick. When I walked into the room and I turned towards my right, I observed Mr. Conrad Murray giving chest compressions to Mr. Jackson. He was laying on his back. Um, with his hands extended out. And I observed that his eyes were, were slightly open or were open and his mouth was uh, uh, open. He reached over and grabbed a handful of vials. And then he reached out to me and said, here, put these in a bag. He pointed uh, towards the IV stand. Okay, an IV stand again uh, was 
in this general area right there in People's 23 near this chair? Correct. He pointed uh, to a bag and he said, now grab that bag and put that in the blue bag. He's got a phone in his hand, 911, but that's not what he did. He called for security help, and when security help arrived, he didn't say, oh my God, we have to save Michael Jackson's life. He said, help me clean this up. It speaks for itself. Well, those are powerful words, it speaks for itself. Um, so, okay, so now you've got uh, the, the, doc, the personal private uh, physician of, of Michael Jackson ordering people around to clean up as he's giving chest compressions. He'd already called them, and then is calling 911. So there's a lot of sort of skeevy uh, behavior immediately following. But then there's the whole notion about the, the drug um, protocols of Michael Jackson. So for starters, he was on a bunch of, um, you know, narcotics. He had been using many different kinds of narcotics. He'd been doctor shopping and he had a doctor that was all too happy to give him different kinds of narcotics. And Conrad Murray said, we're about to go on tour where I'm not going to be able to do this propofol routine with you a whole bunch. So we need to migrate you to benzodiazepines. That wasn't working too well, though. And what Conrad Murray was saying was that, quite frankly, it's entirely possible that Michael Jackson wanted more propofol than I was willing to give him. And so when I walked out of the room, he probably dosed himself the extra. And there was some evidence to indicate that that actually might have happened. But take a look at this uh, little excerpt that just talks about just the, the, the culture of taking drugs when it came to Michael Jackson. Mr. Jackson was receiving large doses of Meperidine or Demerol in um, Dr. Arnie Klein's uh, clinic, which is a highly addictive opioid. Did you see... In reviewing those records, that Arnold Klein had given Mr. Jackson approximately 6,500 milligrams of Demerol during that period of time? I do understand that he was treating Mr. Jackson with Demerol, yes. Murray decided correctly that Jackson needed to be off the propofol infusion. He was completely unaware that Jackson had been receiving regularly doses of a potent addictive narcotic. It appeared that Mr. Jackson was not receiving the Demerol prior in the days leading up to his unfortunate death. And the withdrawal can start rather quickly. Opiate withdrawal is associated with agitation and uh, sleep disorder. So it would have clearly exacerbated any underlying sleep disorder that Mr. Jackson had. So, you know, that became the argument right? Regardless of what you think about a doctor in a private home administering propofol, it's so wrong. Um, and then going and having a chit chat, you know, with your girlfriend, instead of watching the patient at all times, which is really what you should be doing. Perfect, constant monitoring, regardless of what you think of that. Is it possible, Vinny, in your mind, was it reasonable that maybe Michael Jackson, who had such uh, a dependency on drugs and felt like he could take so much because he had, that he might have reached over and actually in the port administered a little more with those syringes. And maybe a little more to him was just a little bit too much. Uh, I, I didn't buy that at the, at the trial. Yeah. I think it's possible. Is it reasonably possible? Not necessarily. I can't get back past the fact that he's not, he's got one job and he's not there. He's yeah. not in the room with him. That's all you have to do is watch a man sleep and make sure he you doesn't had one die. Job. That's all you have to yeah. do. And he was getting a quarter of a million dollars to do that. Yes. And so let's talk about that because, um, you know, ultimately, if the jury was conflicted, then they settled where you are, Vinny. And they said, to heck with this. I don't need to wrestle with this morality. You did that. You walked out and that guy died. And, and I'm sure they all loved him because there wasn't one place on the planet you could go where you wouldn't know the name Michael Jackson. He was, you know, beloved, regardless of the trial, regardless of, you know, his behavior and, and the things that he was accused of doing. People still loved his music. They still loved his dancing. I think a lot of people feel bad for liking Michael Jackson because of his colossal talent. But ultimately, they they found him guilty of, of involuntary manslaughter. But what I found shocking, Vinny, and you get me off the ledge, um, 
I found it shocking that the, the, the maximum sentence in California was only four years. And, you know, you get out, he got out at two years. And then his Texas medical license, well, that was revoked. Okay, I get it. But he had two other medical licenses in two other states, Nevada and California. They were suspended, but not revoked. So again, I'm on the ledge. Help me, Obi-Wan I, Kenobi. I can't. I mean, you're responsible for the death of another human being, and you're a doctor, and you're, you're breaking every oath that there is in what you're doing. Uh, and it's, you, you're it's convicted outrageous. and you serve time. Right, and you serve time. I, yeah. I, well, maybe the marketplace will take care of it because who's, you know, who's going who's gonna to call up and say, yeah, I need to call Dr. Murray, you know? So hopefully. Someone who wants drugs bad will call anybody. I, I don't mean to disparage anyone in this, this potential scene, but, you know, doctor shopping is real and ethics and violations are, are real. And sometimes patients will do anything um, if they're, you know, afflicted with the sickness of addiction. So, that's why I'm sort of shocked that the medical yeah. licenses weren't just automatically revoked. But boy, was it ever interesting. It's always incredible to me, Vinny, when you go back at a story with the, you know, with the benefit of a decade uh, perspective and lens, you know, your prism changes and the light starts to refract in different ways and you just see things in a different way. I can't believe it's been a decade. But then again, it's been more. it has been more than a decade. You, you <laughs> silver fox, you. All you right. know it looks good on you. <laughs> stop, stop. All right, stop. Ashley Banfield, Judgment with Ashley Banfield, 8 o'clock Sunday night. Thanks so much, Ashley. We'll be right back.